Remember, we talked about the question that was asked at the end of chapter 6. And I think it's worth uh, bringing up the last verse of chapter 6. Who can say or who knows what is good for a man in life? That's what Solomon, the richest man in the world, in Ecclesiastes is wrestling with. Solomon is struggling to find the meaning of life. Um, Ecclesiastes is a dangerous book. It can be a dangerous book. As we talked about, it says many times, meaningless, meaningless. Life is meaningless. And so if you come into this book suicidal or <laughs> depressed and uh, at the end of yourself, this book will not help until you get to the end. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There is kind of some glory that comes along. And in fact, he starts to turn in chapter 7. We come to the second half of the book of Ecclesiastes, really, where now he gets back to Proverbs, but he still has a little problem with perspective, a little uh, difference of looking at these Proverbs, as we'll see. But he has tried up to this point. Uh, Solomon has tried pleasure. He's tried entertainment. He's tried music, science, art, wealth, and power. And all of those things, he, in his struggle, in his search, left him empty, meaningless, just desiring more. And just asking more questions. What could be the meaning of life? like a little boy, asking, you know, why am I put here on earth? Why is, what is my purpose? And uh, many around us still struggle with that very thing. Um, and so chapter 7, now he gets back, he kind of reverts back to what he has known. Remember Solomon was brought up in the Lord. Um, as a young man, he walked with the Lord. He heard the voice of the Lord even speaking to him and speaking with him, but he drifted away. And so he knows this stuff. It's been locked up in his head. Even though he's wealthy, he's been through a lot, um, he gets back to these very, and remember we were in, this sounds a lot like Proverbs. You get to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and a lot of these things we read in Proverbs. But again, you'll see the perspective is not quite there. <laughs> so a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. In fact, verse 2, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. And the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, or party town. So, again, these are statements that can be true, depending on the person, right? Depending on the situation, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth for everybody? Is that a true statement across the board? Absolutely not. <laughs> That's where the problem of perspective for Solomon comes into play. We have to be careful uh, saying these kinds of things and declaring, well, God's Word says the day of our death is more, you know, uh, of more value and better than the day of our birth. Part of that is true, but it's, again, back to verse 1, if you have a good name. Now, if you are called by other people, not you call yourself a Christian, but if you are called a Christian, a Christ follower, not if your name is Christian, but if you are called a Christ follower and you're they look at you and they know that you are a Christian just by your conduct, then you have a good name. That is a good name. A good reputation. That is, And so it is more precious than uh, ointment. Precious ointment. It is 
better than than uh, rubies, than silver, than gold, as he said earlier in the book of Proverbs. A good name is better than all of those things. And it goes along with uh, your reputation. That's really what, especially in biblical days, in biblical times, a name meant everything. And it was, you know, more than just the family name carrying and being carried on, but really your what you were known for, and it speaks of your reputation. So that's what we seek after, that's what we desire, and if you're a Christian, if you follow Christ, you have a good name. You can say hallelujah. I've been given a good name. But what a funny question to ask. Is it better to go to a funeral or to go to a wedding? I've been to many more funerals than I have weddings, to be honest. And I've been in like five or six weddings. Um, but I've been to many more funerals. What's amazing is the people that are there at a wedding are not open to talking about eternal things. Anything of eternal value. They're not really interested in eternity when there's much food and feasting and dancing and partying going on, right? At a wedding or at a feast, at a party. And so in the eternal perspective, you can see what Solomon means. How that things begin to get serious. In fact, it's been rightly said that a broken heart leads to an open heart. It really does. In fact, Jesus, or uh, the psalmist would write that a broken and a, con a contrite heart, the Lord will not turn away. He's, he's in, in reality, God is waiting for us to get to that place of being broken and contrite before Him. Why? So that we can be open. So people are more open to hearing about eternity. God can use uh, a uh, message at a funeral <laughs> and, uh, much more effectively, in my experience, than a message at a wedding. Not that God can't use weddings. He still does. But you can see how uh, where, where uh, Solomon is coming from you're thinking, and, and you've got to put yourself in Solomon's shoes, you're talking about parties day after day after day, and wild parties that have music, not radio, but live music going on. And uh, we're told that there were apes and peacocks and wild animals and exotic things that he had going on that no other king, no other ruler had at his time. So just... And then you're, you throw into the mix 700 wives and a 300 concubines. I mean, this guy had the lifestyle of a party. So it's no wonder he tried to drown out what? Sorrow. And he finally comes to a point where sorrow is better than all this laughter, verse 3, that we've been experiencing, that I've been experiencing. The sadness of the countenance makes the heart better. <laughs> the heart can be made better. Now verse 5 reminds me of many things, and I can go on a rant, but it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man or a woman to hear the song of fools. Now, my wife likes country music. She has it on every once in a while, and I... It's right away after reading this verse, thought of this song where this guy, and I don't know who the artist is, but talk about a song of fools. He says, I love this bar. And that's really the, the refrain of the song. I love this bar. <laughs> song of a fool. And he's just, you never use the word love for something like a bar. Talk about not understanding what love is. In fact, Whitney Houston had a song back in the 80s called The Greatest Love. What did she say the greatest love was? The greatest love is to love yourself. Whitney Houston said that. These are songs, just a couple of songs of fools. You will hear the song of fools. Many take heed. Many 
hearken and listen without even realizing it, even memorizing words to songs of fools. And there's many more out there today. <laughs> Those are just a couple of outdated examples too, by the way. But, but song of fools, watch out for the songs that are out there that truly a song does something to someone who has sorrow of heart. Um, it's so much better to hear the rebuke of the wise. How can I hear the rebuke of the wise? Start listening to some Chuck Smith tracks. <laughs> You'll hear it. <laughs> Start listening to some sermons on tape, Bible studies, whatever they may be. Tune into, you know, whatever your local uh, 1100 AM or 1640 AM. You start hearing some sermons that really begin to rebuke you. Some of you are going, what's AM? Oh, <laughs> I'm old, but I'm not that old. I do listen to AM radio. I enjoy it, but for the sermons. Now, as uh, not getting too on to it, as the crackling of thorns under a pot, verse six, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is empty, <laughs> and that makes me think, and it should cause us to think of morning radio programs, which, again, AM radio. There's morning shows you'll listen to, and they're laughing and laughing, and it's like a crackling pot. Some of these empty morning shows that, that some people get addicted to, and I find myself sucked into some of them too, and the crackling of thorns, it was like a play on words in the Hebrew actually, was the nettles over a kettle. And it was just that, that brambling, crackling sound. And it's the laughter of fools can just be that way. Empty and almost, I don't know if you've ever listened to Howard Stern. I don't know if you've ever listened to some of the junk that's out there. And you hear them laugh. And it's a fake laughter. It's this contagious laughter, just like a, like a laugh machi machine that causes... And I don't know if you know that laughter is like that. You start, <laughs> and it starts to make you chuckle. And they do this all the time. I just chose him because he was obvious, an easy target. But all these morning shows, watch out for this stuff. It's empty. And it's like a fire, a little crackling of thorns. Somebody said it's, it's hearing the fuels that will fuel hell ultimately. Just fake laughters to cover up the sorrow. Surely oppression, verse 7, makes a wise man mad. And a gift destroyed, uh, rather, a gift destroys the heart. To see somebody being oppressed should make a wise man angry. I actually experienced this today. I it was just the Lord had me in this spot, right <laughs> right coming out of a uh, burger joint uh, this afternoon. Uh, looked like two boys, maybe 14 years old and 9 or 10 years old with their grandpa, wrote, had ridden their bikes to this burger joint. And they were sitting down eating with us, and, uh, you know, across the table. We didn't know them. And all of a sudden, they leave about the same time we're leaving, and he blew up, this grandpa. Began cursing, and I mean cussing up a storm, outside the shop to his 14 and 10 and not, or 9-year-old grandsons for being a-holes and being this and that and the other, and he's just going off on them, oppressing these poor little guys. And I mean, everybody around just uncomfortable. I wish I could say that I hit him. But I just kind of bit my tongue. I just kind of walked away. But watching it, it makes a wise man gets mad. It made me angry. And it was like, here you are trying to teach these young children how to be... I don't know, adults, how to be 
and you're you're the worst example. I mean, talk about just it did it does it makes you upset when you see that kind of stuff going on. I shouldn't have stayed stayed quiet. I really shouldn't have. I should have spoke up. I should have confronted him. But the Lord had me. The Lord had me do it. Um, the Lord had me just. You know, better to keep your mouth shut and remove all doubt, right? Yeah. <laughs> better to have people think you're a fool. And... But that comes up here, um, what was stirring in that grandpa. Uh, better is the end, verse 8, of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patience in spirit is better than the proud in heart. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be an angry or angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. And it makes me think of that guy again. The thing that stirs up all those words of hatred, all those the profane words, using profanity with little kids. What causes a grandpa, I don't know if it was their grandpa or not, but what causes someone to do that? Anger. Anger. And bottled up anger, that's the idea, resting in the bosom of fools, almost just cradling this anger in your heart, in your bosom, in, within your deep uh, self, there within your heart. There is a time, in fact, the scripture, did you know the scripture says to be angry? Well, no, I'm a Christian, I'm not allowed to be angry. No, the, the scripture tells you to be angry. And do not sin. So there's a righteous outlet. There's, there's a way to, to really get angry. And let it out. Don't let it bottle up to where it turns into that. That it can turn into a display of total foolishness. and uh, Well, it just ruins a reputation. Um, think about the end. Think about the end. I, I did, when I first read verse 8, some of these verses make you just stop. And verse 8 was one of those. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Think about the end. Stop worrying so much about how you're going to begin. How I'm going to start this or that or the other. Whatever it might be. But have the end in sight. Be heavenly minded, right? Right? Have the end in sight. Because it is. It's better to think about the end. Uh, and I, of course, you think of the tortoise and the hare, right? The hare starts off in the beginning, gets going real good, and decides, oh man, I'm way ahead. I'm going to take a nap. And slow and steady, the tortoise makes it to the end. <laughs> the end is better. Again, these are statements that, that can be true. But in some cases, of course, without Christ, um, it's all they have is right now. Uh, say not thou what is the cause that the former days were better than these. For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. In other words, why were the old days better than these? <laughs> We've all been there. Not a good question to ask. Solomon says, don't even go there. <laughs> Bad memories or poor memories and good imaginations. That's the only reason we ever think there was good old days. Because our memories are failing, fading. But we, we'd start to have good imaginations. There were no such things as good old days. I like... Uh, there is no such thing as the good old days here under the sun. We need to understand that. I mean, we all have been guilty. We've all been there where we say, I wish things could be like they were when, you know, back when. But it's all under the sun. In fact, he laid it out, and, and he has laid it out in Ecclesiastes, you know, that People are born, they live, they die. People are born, they live, they die. People are born, they live, they die. He, he laid all that out. And he's going to get to, if I can ever make it through this chapter, 
<laughs> There's no reason to be positive without Christ, without an eternal perspective. That's part of, I think, the intrigue, I think the, the part of the book of Ecclesiastes that I love is it causes you to stop and say, yeah, I mean, here's a guy that had everything to keep him busy. Everything to keep him from even thinking about death, even worrying about any anything or everything. He just was taken care of, and here he's the one that comes along and says, you know what? It's empty. There's no reason for any of it. It's empty. So don't ask the questions. It's, it's a waste of time to sit there and say, Oh, the good old days. If only things could be the way they were. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, verse 11, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. <laughs> For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that which, uh, that wisdom gives life to them that have it. That's the excellency of of knowledge. It's wisdom that brings life. It's wisdom that that he's gonna and he, he understands. That's where it's at. It's not in money, it's not in getting profit, it's not in all of that stuff. In fact, verse 13, consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he has made crooked? In other words, Romans chapter eleven, right? Who has known the mind of the Lord? I think it's verse 34, but don't write that down quite yet. I know it's Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 34. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has ever been His counselor? Who could say, or, or you know, what God has made crooked, no one can make that straight. It's really true. Um, in fact, God is in control. God is on the throne. Even in times when we fail to believe, He's still on the throne. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversar adversity, consider God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. In other words, Job put it this way, God gives and God takes away. He's in control. He's the one who has everything. He's the one that gives everything. And so, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1.21 in prosperity, you can be joyful. And in the day of adversity, God is in control and sees things through. All things have I seen in the day of my vanity. There is a just man that perishes in his righteousness. And there is a wicked man that prolongs his life in his wickedness. How many of you know that's true? There's righteous people that perish and that seem like they died all too young. They're all around us. We know the stories. Great, influential people. People of great influence. And they died so early, so young. And then there's the wicked people that just continue to live on and on and on. You just, man, they're not dead yet. Ding dong, the... Yeah, anyways. Whoever that person is can perish. The wicked that just seem to go on and on and, pr and prosper. David had that same problem, seeing the wicked prosper in their ways. Even Solomon saw that. And I had to write at the end of verse 15, under the sun. I even put in my own little comment to remind me this is under the sun where the righteous seem to die too soon and seem to perish but and the wicked kind of goes on their their way it's only under the sun it's only under in this life and in this world 
Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself overwise. <laughs> Why should you uh, destroy yourself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that thou should take uh, hold of this, yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that fears God, there's the key, there's the key, verse 18, the end of verse 18, he that fears God shall come forth of them all. In other words, it won't matter if you're righteous, if you're wicked, if you're um, foolish, if you're of great stature, or if you're wise, whatever it is, fear God. Fear God and it will bring you through everything. What is the fear of the Lord? The beginning of wisdom and knowledge and truth and uh, understanding. The wisest man in the world still struggled. You could have all the brains in the world. You could be the smartest person in the world. And yet, because it's a spiritual thing, you could be so far from the truth. You could be so far from Him. So fear God. The fear of God will cause you to come forth from them all. Verse 19. Wisdom strengthens the wise. More than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not. <laughs> also take no heed unto all words that are spoken. Good advice. <laughs> Lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knows that thou thyself likewise has cursed others. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? Verse 25. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. He was determined to find the answers. He really was, Solomon. And we know his story. A couple things, though, I wanted to mention. First, verse, uh, verse 20 is worth highlighting. It's worth looking at and knowing and making sure you know there is not a just man upon the earth. No one is good. We talked a little bit this morning about it, but we need to always revisit this because the world around us is trying to lie to us. It's trying to deceive us into thinking there's some good. I mean, all Yep, all means all, and that's all all ever means. There is no one good. No one seeks God. There is no one that does not sin. And take no heed unto all words. I like the word the way that first John chapter four puts this. First John chapter four verse one. Because we do need to be careful. We need to be wise as uh, believers. Had had a, somebody said it the other day. I can't remember who it was, but said, "You know, I feel like the Lord just says to me, believe everything." And I, he said that, and I scratched my head and said, "That's not right." Haven't you ever heard First John chapter four verse one? First John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Don't be naive. Don't be gullible, as so often so many Christians can be, in the name of faith, thinking that that's what faith is, is believing all things. Because it says, love believes all things. <laughs> Twisting the scriptures, right? Always remember those and take them, uh, take them through the word. Re revisit those things. But it also says in uh, 1 Thessalonians, I didn't get the, the address for this one, but somewhere it says to test all spirits. Test all things. 
see if they be in line with the Scriptures. They ought to line up with the Scriptures. So, don't believe all the words that are spoken. How we need to hear that today. All this have I proved by wisdom. Well, we were at verse uh, 25. I applied mine heart, and I, I looked, and I was searching for uh, even of foolishness and of madness, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, who so pleases God shall escape from her. But the sinner shall be taken hold by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher. He's third person there. That's, he's returning. I'm the preacher now. Counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeks, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. That's pretty... That's pretty low for him to say. 700 tries, still hadn't found the right one. <laughs> Imagine being one of those gals. Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. <laughs> We're always looking for something, aren't we? still true to this day. Whether it's a relationship to fulfill those things, a new gadget to fulfill that desire in us. He said earlier in Ecclesiastes, we were all created with eternity in our hearts. And an eternalness, if you will. Eternity has been, we've been built with that within us. And remember, this is the writer of the book of Proverbs who showed us in Proverbs chapter 7, amen? He showed us and talked to his son in Proverbs chapter 7, the wayward woman, the woman that was strange. Anyone who goes that way and takes hold, she has taken many strong men down to the depths of hell. I don't mean, and this is not at all in any way saying that women are bad and wrong and evil. Because you could say it in the same way that men who desire nothing more than pleasure and to draw a woman away from the living God, that's what happened, by the way, to Solomon. He was drawn away by his wives to other gods ultimately leaving him in confusion, in chaos, in pain, in heartache, in sorrow, just searching for anything else to bring him some kind of fulfillment, some kind of... Um, and God wouldn't let go of him. He's wrestling with it. God finally... It's, it, he, he knew and he saw how bitter their end was. These women that thought, I've got the answer for you, Solomon. Come and join me. I've got, you know, this will this will do it for you. And sure enough, empty. Look for the woman, not the Proverbs 7 woman. Look for the woman in Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 shows us the ideal woman. The girls say, well, what about us? You have four Gospels to look at for the perfect man. And then finding him in this world, good luck. <laughs> as far as... But we have, we have those models because there's no woman that lives up to Proverbs 31, by the way. And just as there's no human man you're going to find that'll live up to Jesus Christ. That, there we see in, the four, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So... Um, but again, the heart of Solomon, and uh, you can hear it in his voice, the, the anguish, the pain, the frustration. It is just so much better to go after the, the wisdom of God. Well, continuing on wisdom in chapter 8, he says, Who is as the wise man? 
<laughs> and who knows the interpretation of a thing? Now, a lot of people will give a lot of advice about a lot of different things, won't they? They're willing to give you a lot. And for a price, man, they'll give you books and all kinds of things, courses and classes. Who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. Godly wisdom, which brings interpretation of anything. We have 66 books. They're sitting in our lap. 40 different authors, right? And this causes us to interpret different things in life. How do we interpret different things in life? A true explanation about anything needs to come from a godly perspective, not a worldly perspective. A true explanation about anything in life needs to come from a godly perspective and not man's perspective or a worldly perspective. I counsel thee, verse 2 of chapter 8, I counsel you to keep the king's commandments and that in regard of the oath of God, or sorry, yeah, of the oath of God that you've made. In other words, because you're Christians, obey the king. You mean submit to the authorities that have been placed in, in above? Yeah, Romans chapter 13. It's always my least favorite scripture too. 1 Peter. <laughs> if Romans 13 doesn't get you, then First um, Peter, uh, I thought I wrote that one. I guess I did. First Peter two thirteen. There it is. I wrote it down. First Peter two thirteen. Romans thirteen one. They let us know that authority is set in place by God, and that it is our duty to submit to those authorities. We need to be obedient and to submit. Why? Because God is our King. In other words, we have made an oath to God. Some people don't like to submit to the speed limits. But that police officer we've read in, if you continue reading in Romans 13, he does not bear the gun on his hip in vain. It's not meaningless. The stuff that's going on, it's not meaningless. And you're going to be a bigger witness being obedient to the authorities over you than what you think you might do in protesting, which we're seeing animals out on the streets, well, humans acting like animals out on the streets, protesting against our very nation. <laughs> that they're free to do. I mean, it's, it's the irony of all ironies. I don't know if you understand that. Here they've been given the freedom to do all kinds of things, and they're spitting in the faces of everyone who's died for this country by protesting and marching through the streets. And they are demanding the right to kill. <laughs> they are. They call it abortion, but they are, they are demanding to be able to continue to murder and to continue to kill and destroy. And it's, it's again, you don't want to get into that going against the authorities that God has set in place. Is there a time for us to go against the authority? You bet. Get to know and write down Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Many of you know probably Romans 13 by heart. You know that I didn't like turning there, but do you know Acts chapter 5, verse 29 by heart? I hope you do, because Peter was told, do not preach ever again in the name of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter said something we all need to know. I... I ought to obey God rather than a president of the United States of America. I ought to obey, my interpretation, I ought to obey God rather than man. So when the worldly 
system when the authority that God has set in place goes against God's authority, who wins? I'll ask you and I'll leave you with that. You answer the question. If someone asks you to go do something that goes against, like abortion, like gay marriage, I'll just put them out there for you. That, those are totally against God and the Word of God. If someone asks you to accept that, someone asks you to go along with that, who wins in your mind? Is it, is it culture? Is it man's teachings? Is it man's ways? Or is it God's ways? Acts 5.29 I ought to obey God rather than man. And we ought to fear God more than the fear of COVID. More than the fear of man. Which is all around us. And it's been empowering people. It's been bringing about a, a force that's not godly. It's, it's just as corrupt as patriotism was. Being all about America. If I was born in America, I don't need to worry about praying the sinner's prayer. How many of you know that's garbage? Just as much. We need the extremes. God needs to make it this extreme for me to get it. <laughs> so, there's dangers on both ends. We need to be God's people. We need to be pledging allegiance unto Jesus Christ first. Amen? Amen. Only kneel when there's a cross. That's the only time that we kneel. You stand when that flag comes up. Never kneel unless there's a cross. Watch out for the stuff that's out there that's just garbage. In fact, 1 Corinthians, I, I'm getting heated tonight. 1 Corinthians 3.19 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. He takes the wise in their own craftiness. I love that. God is so uh, beyond man. God is just so much more. Uh, and then 1 Corinthians 2.14 also. The natural man, everyone out there, and I have the natural man in me, we receive not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto Him. Neither can we even know them because they are spiritually discerned. How can I know? <laughs> the Word, the Word, the Word. I need to be in the Word much more than I am. <laughs> because that is how I am able to discern what is natural, what is spiritual. What I need to take heed to, what I need to obey what I need to fear, the, the laws that come down that I need to be about, whatever they are. A true explanation about anything needs to come from a godly perspective. I, I don't know why, but that just keeps coming up and the Lord had me write that twice for a reason. A true explanation about anything needs to come from a godly perspective, not man's perspective or a worldly perspective. Uh, verse 3 though, back to Ecclesiastes 8, do not be hasty to go out of his sight or stand not in an evil thing for he does whatsoever he uh, pleases him. He's talking about the king. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what are you doing? You know, what doest thou? Whoso keeps the commandment shall feel no evil thing. And a wise man, uh, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore the misery of a man is great upon him. For he knows not that which shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? The king, he doesn't know the future. And no one can question the king or look at the king and say, how dare you uh, let that law pass? 
which, again, you have protesters in the streets. How dare that law pass? How dare those judges make that decision? And it's foolish. It's, again, you're fighting the wrong battle. Because, again, the perspective is not right. But, you see, if you are not passionate about Jesus Christ, you will be passionate about, I don't know, recycling. You'll become passionate about, I don't know, save the whales. You'll, you'll become passionate about something, and it will be to an extreme. And you've got to remember that, that they don't have Christ. <laughs> They're not passionate about Christ. And it helps, I, at least for me, it, it puts things in perspective. Um, God is long-suffering. So, we can't stand up to the king and say, what are you doing? I don't like what you're doing. Um, we have to understand. The king doesn't know the future. There is no man that has power over the spirit. Verse uh, 8, <coughs> excuse me, goes on. There is no man uh, that has power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit. Neither has he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given over to it. All this have I seen and applied mine heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man rules over another to his own hurt. <laughs> we need to understand that. No matter who's president, no matter who's in charge, God is on the throne and they will get what's coming to them. Whoever they are. In fact, uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 6. Romans chapter 2, verse 6, in case you forget these things. Romans 2, verse 6. Very clear. Doesn't matter who you are. Romans 2, verse 6, God says this. He will render to every single human being according to their deeds. Whoever it is, they will get what's coming to them. God will... <laughs> It, it, we're going to say, right? Righteous and true are your judgments. So don't, don't worry so much about the decisions that are being made, that are, the laws that are being passed. Don't worry. Um, they have theirs coming. And always remember, there will be a new king. There will be a new earth. There will be a new heaven. The kings of earth don't know the future. The kings of earth are weak the kings, the, the rulers of this earth are, are just passing. So verse t uh, 10, we'll finish out the chapter here. So, I saw the wicked buried, and uh, they had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. <laughs> this is also empty, vanity, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. It's not fast enough. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil in a hundred times, his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are a shadow, or as a shadow." because he fears not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth that there be just men, <laughs> and unto whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. And then I commended mirth. <laughs> I went back to party town, if you will. Because a man has no, nothing better under the sun than to eat, to drink, and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God has given, uh, God gives him under the sun. 
when I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to, to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night set, uh, sees sleep with his eyes, then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall find fi shall not find it. Yet, yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Kind of describes what he said earlier, and that is uh, grasping at the wind. Remember that phrase that we looked at. He's, he's looking to just fathom it, just to, to take it in and, and comprehend it, and it, it, there's no answer under the sun. This is why heaven is so crucial. This is why it's so vital for you and I to believe that there's a heaven. To, to be living for heaven. To be hope-filled people. And not people of the earth. Not earth dwellers. Don't belong to the earth. Because there's, there's no reason to go on. His, his whole point is you ought to just be drunkards, gluttons, and just live it up as much as you can if all there is is this. <laughs> go for it. There's no reason to be happy. That's what's so devastating about the book of Ecclesiastes when you... And, and somebody said, if you really understand life, and you really are smart, you're going to be very depressed without Christ. You have all the facts, you're, you're a brilliant mind, you understand the way life works, you understand a lot about life, education can be dangerous. Because... Unless Christ is at the center, we just keep learning more and more about this world around us and about so much. You start to look and you see these these uh, conspiracy theories that come out, and you see people that go crazy. They get infected with something called sin. It it works its way in in so many different ways, whether it's it's uh, well, it's pride. Ultimately, it's pride. Thinking I know more than God. Thinking I can't just believe in something I've never seen. If that's the case, Solomon says, live it up. You'll find it sooner. You'll be empty. I forget what actor it was. He says, I wish that everyone could have the money and the stuff that I've come to have so they all could know. Jim Carrey? I guess that's, yeah. Maybe. So they all could know how empty it really is. And that's Solomon's whole statement. So that everyone might just know. You know what? There's no fulfillment in any of it. It's fleeting. In fact, we read earlier, what does the rich man, how does he differ from the homeless man with nothing? The rich man is up all night, tossing and turning about losing it all. And the homeless guy is snoozing over there, getting a great night's rest. He's got nothing. Nothing to worry about. The problem is in our, especially in our nation, we have the, the whole uh, lottery and, and the, the crave, the desire, the very, uh, well... The fundamental thing about First Timothy 6 is money is not the root of all evil. I, I hope you know that. Money, nothing wrong with money. But what do most homeless people, most beggars, why are they on the streets? Why are they begging? The love of money. Greed, chasing after it with everything in them. That's where it's taken them. That's where it's left them. Sad, sad estate. But we've all, we all still have that within our natural man, within us. 
greed and lust and pride and going after things that will not fulfill us, but yet we return to it like a dog returns to vomit. <laughs> we learned this morning that we're unclean in a lot of different ways. If you weren't here, you have a homework assignment. Read Leviticus 15 and laugh later on your own. Laugh at the embarrassment of doing it in a church setting like we did this morning but then understand that we're human we're all unclean we're sinners and we need to be clean we need to be made pure we need to be made righteous in fact what did jesus say be perfect even as your father in heaven anybody perfect one brave soldier. Even as my Father in heaven is perfect, you be perfect. And what Leviticus is teaching us, to be ye holy, what it means to be set apart from the world, not like the world around us. Do things differently. Don't get into the way that the world gets into stuff. Just... Be different. Come out from among them and be separate. Amen? Father, thank you for your word tonight, Lord. I pray as we sing these last few songs, Lord, you would just be pleased with our hearts and give us eyes to see, give us ears to